This is the third video in the Biology Key Skills tutorial video series. In this video, we will be looking at enzymes. In this video, we will describe how enzymes work using the lock and key model. We will look at why a denatured enzyme cannot perform its function correctly, and we will look at the role of digestive enzymes. Our big question today is to explain the lock and key hypothesis. So what are enzymes? Enzymes are biological catalysts. This means that they speed up the reactions inside cells. By using enzymes, your body can ensure that only the useful chemical reactions are happening. This allows it to carefully control what is and what isn't going on in your body. In fact, in your body, there are around 75,000 enzymes. In chemical reactions, molecules either split apart or are joined together. Both of these can be carried out by enzymes. These can be synthesis reactions where the two molecules are brought together. This is also known as an anabolic reaction or a catabolic reaction where they are split apart in a breakdown reaction. In order to explain how enzymes can act as a catalyst, we need to look at the lock and key model. In this, we have our enzyme. Each enzyme has a specific active site. This is where the reaction will take place. This active site is specific to a substrate. This is the molecule that will react. Because the active site and the substrate are the same shape, there is high specificity between the enzyme and the substrate. For the reaction to take place, the substrate needs to bind with the enzyme in the active site. This then forms something known as the enzyme-substrate complex. Once this complex has been formed, the reaction can now take place. In this case, the substrate is going to be split into two products. The enzyme can then be reused over and over. How the enzyme and the substrate go together is known as a lock and key. The enzyme is the lock and the substrate is the key. When an enzyme stops working, it is usually because it has become denatured. This means that it has changed shape. This is usually caused by high temperature or being outside of the optimum pH. When an enzyme becomes denatured, it changes its shape. This means that its active site changes shape. This means it can no longer successfully bind with its substrate. For example, the enzyme on the left, which is not denatured, can fit the substrate perfectly. However, on the enzyme on the right, the substrate can no longer bind. This will cause the enzyme to no longer be able to act as a catalyst for this reaction. For your GCSE, you need to know about three different conditions that can affect the rate of reactions for enzymes. These are temperature, pH and substrate concentration. There is a graph that you need to know for each of these. We will start with temperature. With temperature, changing your temperature affects the rate of reaction in an enzyme catalyzed reaction. Initially, as the temperature increases, so does the rate of reaction, until we reach the optimum temperature. After we have reached the optimum temperature, the enzyme starts to denature. This means that after we've reached the optimum temperature, the rate of reaction starts to decrease until all of the enzyme has denatured. When we are talking about the optimum temperature, we mean the temperature at which the rate is at its highest possible point. Our second graph is for pH. pH is a measure of how acidic or alkaline the solution that the enzymes are in is. To describe this graph, initially as pH increases, so does the rate of reaction, until we reach the optimum pH for that enzyme. For most enzymes, the optimum pH is often between 7 and 8. However, certain enzymes that are involved in digestion, which we will look at later in this tutorial video, work best at different pH levels. 
Once we reach the optimum pH for the specific enzyme, the rate of enzyme activity is at the highest point. Past this optimum, as we saw with temperature, the enzyme starts to denature and as such the rate decreases. However, unlike temperature, too low a pH will also cause denaturing, whereas too low a temperature will just lower the rate of reaction due to the particles having less energy. The final condition we need to be able to describe is the effect of substrate concentration. By substrate concentration, we mean the amount of substrate in the solution with the enzymes. In this case, we are keeping the concentration of enzymes the same. Initially, as substrate concentration increases, so does the rate of reaction. Because it is more likely that both the enzyme and the substrate will meet up within the solution. However, we reach a certain point. This is the point of saturation. At this point, the enzyme is working as quickly as possible. Therefore, if we were to add any more substrate into our solution, it would not make any difference on the rate as all of the active sites are full. The enzyme physically cannot work any quicker. As with the Key Skills 2 video, where we looked at microscopes and how to set up a light microscope, there is a core practical within enzymes. On this, we need to be able to investigate the effect of pH on enzyme activity. We will do this using amylase, which catalyzes the breakdown of starch to maltose. We will be using iodine to detect if starch is present, because if starch is present, the iodine solution will change from brownie orange to blue black. Therefore, we can use this to investigate how pH would affect the enzyme activity. To do this, we would start by putting a drop of iodine solution into every well of a spotting tile. We then heat a water bath to 35 degrees C. We need to make sure the temperature is constant. We will be using 35 degrees C as this is the optimum temperature for amylase. We then add three centimeters cubed of amylase solution and one centimeter cubed of buffer solution with a pH of five to a boiling tube. We heat this up for five minutes. Once this has been heated for five minutes, we then use a different syringe to add three centimetres cubed of starch solution to our boiling tube as well. We mix it and then start the stop clock. We then take a sample every 10 seconds and drop it into a well. This will tell us when the starch solution has been fully broken down by the amylase. This is known as continuous sampling. If the iodine solution remains brown-orange coloured, then this means that starch is no longer present, so the amylase has broken it all down. We then repeat this whole experiment with different buffer solutions to see different pHs and the impact that they have on the activity of amylase. It is also important to remember you would need to control any other variables, for example the concentration and volume of the amylase solution, in order to ensure that it is a fair test. Within this experiment, we can also calculate the rate of reaction. Rate is the measure of how much something changes over time. For this experiment, we would calculate it using the following formula. Rate equals 1000 divided by time. For example, in the reaction we were just looking at, it may take the amylase 60 seconds to break down all of the starch at pH 5. This would mean the rate of the reaction would be 1000 divided by 60, giving us a rate of 16.67 seconds to the minus 1, because the rate is given per unit time. You can also do this to look at the volume released per time. So for example, if we had 24 centimetres cubed of oxygen released in 50 seconds, the rate of the reaction would be 0 0.48 centimetres cubed per second. 
An easy way to calculate this is that we replace the 1,000 in the rate here with the volume given in the specific question you are answering. As mentioned earlier in this video, there are over 75,000 enzymes in your body. A large number of these have a role in digestion. The role of enzymes in digestion is essential as they help to speed up the reactions that break down the large molecules that we consume in our food. For example, the proteins, the lipids and the carbohydrates. These are all very large molecules that are too big to pass through the walls of our digestive system. Therefore, digestive enzymes help break them down into smaller soluble molecules that can easily pass through the walls of the digestive system, allowing them to get into the bloodstream. Enzymes do a similar job in plants, where plants store energy in the form of starch, which is a carbohydrate, and they need to break that down in order to then carry out respiration to transfer energy that they can then use to grow. Proteins are broken down by proteases into amino acids. Lipids are converted by lipases into glycerol and fatty acids. And finally, carbohydrates break down carbohydrates into simple sugars. Amylase, which we looked at on the previous slide, is an example of a carbohydrate. As mentioned earlier, some enzymes do not have an optimum pH of 7. Two good examples of this are pepsin and trypsin. Both of these are proteases. Pepsin has an optimum pH of 2, as it is found in the stomach, whereas trypsin has an optimum pH of 6.8, as it is found in the small intestine. The main lipid in your body is human pancreatic lipase, or HPL. Some digestive enzymes work by joining together smaller components in order to make larger molecules. For example, glycogen synthase joins together chains of glucose molecules in order to make glycogen. This allows the body to store glycogen. We will look at this more in a future video when we look at diabetes and the glucoregulation system. We can also make proteins by joining together amino acids. We will look at this in protein synthesis. And finally, there are lots of enzymes involved in the synthesis of lipids from fatty acids and glycerol. In this tutorial video, we have looked at how enzymes work using the lock and key model. We've explained why a denatured enzyme cannot perform its function correctly. We've had a look at the role of enzymes in digestion. So our big question today was to explain the lock and key hypothesis. I want you to have a go at that question now. So for the lock and key hypothesis, the active site has a complementary shape to the specific substrate. This means that each enzyme is specific to one substrate. The substrate binds to the active site to form the enzyme substrate complex where the reaction takes place forming the products. In this case, the enzyme is the lock and the substrate is the key. That concludes the third tutorial video in the Biology Key Skills series. In the next video, Key Skills video four, we will be looking at cell transport, looking at diffusion, osmosis, and active transport.